The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of abundance, you open wide your hand and fill every living being with plenty. Sustain us with faith in your providence. Give us words for your praise and blessing, and make us generous in sharing your bread with the needy in body and spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Job with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah, the Hattite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent a word to Job, send me Uriah the Hattite. And Job sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Job and the people fed, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to the house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, you have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah remain in boots, and my Lord Job and the servants of the Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and lie with my wife? As you live, as you, your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Job and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hard set fighting and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. The word of the Lord. Please pray the psalm responsibly by half verse. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. All are corrupt and committed by the there is no The Lord looks down from heaven upon us all. See if there is any one wise, if there is one who seeks to have Everyone has proved faithless, all alike have turned bad. Have they no knowledge, all the, those uh, evildoers? See how they tremble with fear. Their aim is to confound the plans of the afflicted. Oh, that Israel's deliverance will come out of Zion. A 
reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place. So they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. The Gospel of the Lord. While I was on my retreat and vacation, um, I stayed for a few days with my uh, cousin, who's a chef. And he's a chef for one of the local grocery chains back home, and so he supervises their, their catering operation, plus uh, any of the prepared foods that they sell 
uh, in the stores, you know, ready-made meals and things like that. And so he would get home from work about 7 o'clock at night, and then he wanted to make supper. And so sometimes he would ask, what are you hungry for? And I would just say, whatever you want to make is fine with me. Um, and so he did, you know, always more than we needed. The only problem was that he, we were eating like at 8 or 9 o'clock at night, which might be fashionable in some places, but some of us old people don't do so well eating that late at night. So at any rate, <clears throat> my cousin would ask, and I'd just basically always say the same thing, just, you know, make whatever you want to make, because I'm hungry for it all, basically. <laughs> What we hunger for, <clears throat> excuse me, will determine what we have to do uh, in order to satisfy that hunger. We know, for example, that if you want a special meal or you want to just prepare any old food, if you don't have it, you've got to go get it. And then you need the time to prepare it. Whatever we want to do to satisfy a hunger, whether it's for food, or for a relationship, or for financial security, or what have you, <clears throat> excuse me, we have to go about the necessary uh, steps in order to make it a reality, to make it possible. And it's also sometimes when we aren't sure what it is we're really hungry for that we can make all kinds of mistakes. What was David hungry for in the first reading today? Was he really hungry for lust and to just have Bathsheba even for just a few minutes of pleasure? Was it something else he was trying to satisfy in his life? That he was willing not only to commit adultery, but also to commit murder in order to cover his adultery and Bathsheba's pregnancy. David had many wives. David had many concubines. You know, women that weren't married to him, but who were his partners. And so he had money, he had power, he had prestige, he had God's blessing. He had everything that anybody could think he would want, but he just wanted more and more and more. And it was that lusting really for more that ended up messing up not only himself, but generations of his family thereafter. Because all of the evil that David ends up doing <clears throat> has an effect down through the generations, starting with Solomon, who's the son born of Bathsheba. What St. Paul does in the second lesson, is try to tell the new Christian converts in Ephesus why their hunger is going to be satisfied absolutely because they have recognized what it really is that they wanted. Now maybe David in his time wanted this sense of order or a sense of control or <clears throat> just the sense of, I'm God's anointed, and so whatever I want should come to me. But he was never satisfied. Because what he really wanted, he never got. Which was real peace in his heart, which was a sense of the love of God really and truly touching on him. Not just in his head, but in his heart. 
And so he tried to fill it with battle, he tried to fill it with money, he tried to fill it with sex, he tried to fill it with all kinds of things. But Paul tells the Ephesians, you know, may God grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth of God's love, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. What he's telling them is that they, in their lives, have had this desire for something. They've been hungering for something. So Paul says, what are you hungry for? Are you hungry for real, lasting love? Are you hungry for real, lasting mercy? For real, lasting compassion, forgiveness, understanding, whatever it may be, that's what you receive when you hunger for God. When you hunger for Christ, this is what you receive. And that's what satisfies the deepest longing of the human heart. Nothing else will. You know, many times people who are caught in the world of addictions, once they become willing to deal with their addiction and follow the steps that they need so that they stay clean and sober, and whether it's alcohol or drugs or sex or, or food or what have you, all the addictions that there are, many times they will say that what they've tried to do is they try to drink or to dr drug themselves in other ways or to just keep trying to have another experience, another conquest, another, uh, another, you know, another course of a meal, uh, another dessert, whatever. They try to, in a sense, stuff down that feeling of emptiness and just plain dissatisfaction with life to the point that they come more and more, become more and more frustrated. And they become more and more frustrated because an addiction can never be satisfied. You're always going to want more. You're always going to want the next fix, the next drink the next conquest, the next meal, whatever. You're going to continue to want and want some more because every addiction is progressive. And ultimately, addictions are fatal. And so, instead of trying to satisfy the real need or identify the real need that we have. Many times we identify it as something else. Well, if I just have a little bit more of this, if I just watch three or four more episodes of this program that I'm addicted to on TV, even though I'll be up until three o'clock in the morning, I'll feel okay because I know what's going to happen. Or if I just have one more drink or one more of this or one more of that. It's never enough because it can't be. The only thing that will ever be enough is what Paul talks about and what Jesus offers to us. You know, the people are following Jesus because they see, as it says in the beginning of the gospel, they see what he's done for the sick and so they were chasing after him because they want to see some more miracles or maybe they have a few sick members of their own family that could benefit from Jesus' healing. And so you've got all of these people there and you hear the dialogue that goes on. You know, how are, how are we going to get enough uh, to see all of these people? 
And Philip says, there's no way. We don't have enough money to do that. And then Andrew comes along and he tells them what, what they have. And then so Jesus then takes over. Jesus knew, as it says, Jesus knew what he was going to do. The fact that he fed them was one sign of what Jesus was about. That is, that he knows that human beings have to eat. And he knew that they would not listen to one word he said if they were there, excuse me, if they were there hungry and just obsessing about what they're going to do to satisfy that hunger. So this miracle is, first of all, a sign of the response of God to the real needs of his people. But it's then a sign that points beyond to something more. And that is that what Jesus has come to do in the teaching that he was doing and the revelation that this becomes when he multiplies the loaves and the fish is an invitation to put faith and trust in him, to believe in him and what he's saying because that will ultimately be the thing that feeds the real human hunger for love, for forgiveness, for understanding, for compassion, for mercy. That's the thing that it invites the people to see, invites us, the readers or the listeners, to respond to. And so what happens is that these people as the gospel will go on, and we'll hear from John chapter 6 over the next several Sundays, you'll see as it in unfolds what the people do and how Jesus takes them step by step to understand that what it, God's be doing here, what God is all about, and what it is that he is offering to them beyond their wildest dreams. We have to know what we are hungry for so we know how to go about satisfying that hunger. Hopefully, today, in our celebration of the Eucharist, we can look a little more deeply and see if we are hungering for Jesus, if we're hungering for God, if we're really hungering for an experience of the living God. You know, one of the things that that uh, comes out in a directed retreat like I was on uh, you know, two weeks ago now, is in the, in the Jesuit model of that retreat, St. Ignatius Loyola puts a lot of stress on having an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's one of the graces that we are to pray for that we will have the grace to grow more intimate with Jesus Christ because when we are fully immersed in the relationship with Christ, then the Lord not only can pour his love into us, but then through us, his love can touch other people. I mean, it's not a unique idea, but it's a way of putting everything together. My retreat director summarized it in more popular words, but what she said to me was, you pray for the grace to see Jesus more clearly, to love him more dearly, and to follow him more nearly, day by day. Some of us may remember from Godspell that the, the particular melody but several weeks ago, we sang a traditional melody to that prayer in, from, our, uh, from our hymnal. And the words are by St. Richard of Chichester, who was Bishop of Chichester in the Middle Ages, who wrote those words. And so what I want to suggest to you today is this. Take a few minutes sometime today just to look and see what it is that you really most hunger for in your life? 
What is it that you're hungry for? Hopefully, you will be able to say that you're really hungry for God. But I want to lead you. I want you to do that examination of your own conscience and see what it is you're really hungry for. And if you do really sense that you want to be in a closer relationship with Jesus, that you would pray specifically for the grace, as I just mentioned, to see Jesus more clearly, to love him more dearly, and follow him more nearly, day by day. As we receive the Lord in the Eucharist today, keep that prayer in mind. And in the silence of your own heart after receiving, just if that prayer rings true to you, just speak that to the Lord as you receive him. And in that way, I think you will begin to know why we have no need to fear because Christ is always with us.